Hello. Well, I started studying internet addiction in 1995, shortly after a friend of mine's husband was addicted to AOL chat rooms. He was spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week at a time when it was still $2.95 an hour. Create a financial burden, but their marriage ended in divorce when he started meeting women in online chat rooms. Now, it made me wonder if people could get addicted to the internet in the same way we talk about drugs, alcohol, and sex. So I posted a small survey online. I took the same clinical criteria that one would use to define uh, pathological gambling, and I just substituted the word internet, and I just wanted to see what I would find. Well, back when I probably had two email a month, I had over 50 emails, all from people telling me how they lost their jobs and their marriages, students across the country having problems with the very tool that they were being encouraged to use. So I expanded my survey, and by 1996, I had presented the first study on internet addiction at the American Psychological Association. And by 1998, I wrote Caught in the Net, the first book to identify internet addiction as a new disorder. Now, all this was met with great controversy and skepticism, which I understood. Look, it was new. It was before the dot-com bubble burst. But I'm here to say, 20 years later, this is now considered a rapidly new field. There's been thousands of internet uh, uh, research uh, topics on internet addiction. It's now not only just looking at it, but looking at treatment protocols, looking at risk factors. There's hundreds of inpatient treatment centers looking at this as a real disorder. So here I am today to talk a little bit about what is internet addiction? What are some of the ways people get hooked and how can we better manage technology in our day-to-day -day lives? Now one of the first questions I'm often asked is how much time is too much? And that'd be like trying to diagnose alcoholism by counting the number of drinks one consumes. You know, 10 drinks a week is okay, but 11 or more is a problem. We really can't quantify addictions that way. What we're really doing is trying, especially with the ubiquitous nature of the internet, what we really want to do is look at a set of behaviors. So let's see. You know, the first one, here you have somebody texting while driving, but that's really only part of the pathology. What we often see are people preoccupied with their cell phones and their digital devices. Ask yourself, how many times do you check your smartphone during the day? I know people that check their Facebook 50 times a day. I know that they check their Twitter feed 50 times a day, their email 50 times a day. I've worked with people that have gotten into three, four, five car accidents, texting while driving. And thank God they didn't kill themselves or others, but they can't seem to stop the compulsive behavior. Here is an internet cafe from China. In China, Korea, and Taiwan, internet addiction is most problematic and most prevalent. Here you're looking at people that might spend 8, 10, 12 hours every day gaming. Now when you talk about symptoms, here you're talking about, you know, how long they spend on the internet, consequences because of behavior, losing sleep, losing poor nutrition, um, losing interest in other activities just to be on the game. Now in America, it's considered more of a silent addiction. You know, you're not seeing a lot of these internet cafes here. It's happening in your homes, in people's bedrooms. And there are gamers that we treat that, you know, they can't, they fail school because they can't stop gaming. Or they live back at home uh, at their parents because they can't hold a job because they can't stop gaming. We also treat what I call Facebook moms. Here we are, Facebook moms. And, um, yeah, you know, do you know anybody that plays Candy Crush Saga, um, Farmville, or a number of games? But now I'm talking about people that also, you know, forget to pick up their kids at school, forget to feed them dinner, or they forget to, you know, put them to bed. They're so consumed by the behavior. We also treat men addicted to internet pornography. And if they're doing this in their job, there we go, if they're doing this at work, then they risk getting fired. If they do this at home, they risk getting divorced. With, we also treat, uh, just, I'm sorry, I'm clicking and there we go. Um, we also treat people who are addicted to internet gambling and they're spending money they don't have on virtual casinos. And oftentimes this isn't the same person who might go to Atlantic City or Vegas, but it's usually a younger, tech savvy, male dominated set of teenagers and college students. With any element of addiction is an element of escape. What you're really looking at are people that can create these online lives 
through the computer that they like better than their own. So here with a lot of gamers, these are virtual worlds or communities. So these gamers can create an avatar or a character and live in a virtual world with other gamers, okay? And there's usually battles and goals within the game to uh, achieve. But now you might have somebody who's in real life has low self-esteem, is you know socially very awkward, but yet in the game, they become a great warrior. And now they've earned respect They've earned power and dominance and recognition from the other gamers. And this is very important to understand because that's really part of the psychology of what we're saying is more the addiction. Here's a screenshot from Second Life. This is more of a virtual community. And within Second Life, what happens is that you have, um, you know, residents, as they call them. And it's more just a virtual community where you can hang out, you can go shopping, you can go have a job, you can go to take college classes. So you live, you hang out. And it's like a game, but it, it gives the example that I'm trying to make about these virtual worlds. So first off, you create an avatar where I can be anybody I want to be, okay? I could be a tall blonde. I could be a short redhead. I could be older, thinner, taller, younger. I could be a man. And that's the wish fulfillment. I can create in my virtual second life something I can't do in my real life. And that's very important. Now, in order to actually buy things in second life, it's free to set up your avatar, but then American currency gets exchanged into Linden dollars. Linden Labs owns second life. So there's currency to buy clothes, to buy a car, to buy a home, to buy furnishings in this virtual community. So that's very important. Actually, economists study this. I mean, millions of people use this and they look at consumer behavior. Now, clinically, I see it on the downside of it where people spend and invest an awful lot in their virtual world. So for example, I worked with a 55-year-old uh, legal secretary and in her real life, she had a very modest home, modest cars, modest clothes. She had embezzled $400,000 from the law firm she worked for, all to support her second life avatar. Again, in her real life, very modest living. In her second life, she was a great baroness. She had diamonds and, you know, jewelry and furs, and she had uh, exotic cars and exotic homes, and she had this sort of wish fulfillment of status and power that she could not achieve in her own life. So what do we do about all this? Does treatment and recovery mean going cold turkey? And the answer is no. This isn't like treating, uh, using an abstinence model like you would for drugs or alcohol. It's really more about a food addiction. And it's looking at moderated, controlled, positive use of this technology. So the kind of terms that we often use then with clients are digital diet and digital nutrition. So with digital diet, you're talking about a restriction in the number of hours, very much like you would the restriction in the number of calories one consumes. So instead of checking Facebook 50 times a day, you check it once a day. Instead of checking Twitter 50 times a day, maybe three times a day. Instead of email 50 times a day, maybe only three times. So it's very prescribed, very controlled use of the internet. Now, with digital nutrition, it's actually about what you click on. So if you're the gamer who can't, you know, go to school and, and is failing out and living back at home with his parents because you can't hold a job, maybe you need to abstain from gaming. But you can still use the internet for very practical things. Maybe you need to research a paper for school, or you need your email for work, or you need to make airline reservations or hotel reservations. So there's really about productive use of the internet, and it's sort of the difference between, you know, eating your uh, bag of potato chips or maybe eating fruits and vegetables, okay? So it's really, again, not villainizing technology, but really trying to say, how is this promoted in our own daily lives? Now, here's a photograph of a family sitting around the dinner table and they're all on their technology. This might even be your own home, right? I argue that we're all a bit too connected. And, and you know, we live in a lot of electronic noise that we don't even think about. You know, how many times do you go out to dinner and you see the couple next door to you and they're just looking at their, their screens and they're not talking to each other? How many times do you go to the mall and you see a group of teenagers and they're just texting and, talk, and not talking, all right? We do, we live with kind of all this noise in our day-to-day -day lives. So what can you do to better manage technology every day? Well, first, I got three tips. First, check your checking. You know, how many times do you check your smartphone each day? The next time you feel the need to check it, stop. You, you know, be more present with the person around you. You know, is it really that important to keep checking that cell phone all the time? 
I mean, look, I'm a victim of this too. Every week I go to meetings and the first thing everybody at the meeting puts their smartphones on the table and, and a few minutes into the meeting, what does somebody do? You know, somebody's checking their, their email, somebody's texting. You're not really being present. And as much as we like to think we can multitask, we can't. You know, we don't do that very well and research says so. The, this kind of leads to the second point, set time limits. Set some boundaries in your day-to-day -day life. If you're a parent, how many times are you checking your smartphone in front of your children and what kind of behavior is that modeling? You know, if you're a couple, leave, leave the cell phones at home and go out to dinner. Actually talk. People are like, wow, really? I challenge everyone to take a 48-hour digital detox in your own life. Maybe it's Friday night, you plug the phone on the charger and you don't look at it again till Monday morning. Or take any two days and people go, well, no, I need to check my phone. I can, what are you saying? That's ludicrous. But you know what? I guarantee you, you will feel better. You know what? You're going to have renewed energy and renewed time because you don't really realize how much you start to check it. We've learned to live without boredom or idle time in our environment because we just kind of fill it now with technology. And so anytime you're bored, you, you look down and, oh, did somebody text me? Probably it's not that important. But I guarantee you, you'll feel a lot differently about it. And this leads to the next and final point, disconnect to reconnect. Have tech-free family time every night. Maybe the dinner table, there's no devices. Maybe even one hour after dinner, you say no media, no television, no video games, no nothing. People go, well, what do we do? Well, I don't know, maybe you'll talk to each other. You know, think about that. You know, when I was younger, we used to take Sunday drives all the time. And it was our kind of family time. Think about the Sunday drive today where, you know, somebody's wearing the iPod, somebody's playing a DVD player, somebody's texting, somebody's gaming on their phone. No, leave it at home. Really kind of focus in on each other. I guarantee you, you're going to feel much better and have more quality relationships. It's, it's not a permanent thing. It's just temporary pieces in your day-to-day -day life that'll really improve your relationships. Now, one of the more alarming things now is the children as young as two, three, and four years old now have access to technology. Actually, there's a picture there of the iPad uh, bouncy seat, okay? And over here is an iPotty chair. So yeah, no kidding, huh? So what happens now is you have um, toddlers that now we've put technology right into their, their devices like their electronic toys. And some people would say, well, that's harmless. Isn't that, oh, no big deal. No. The question is now shifted from how much time is too much to how young is too young. Because new research is already starting to show great concerns. New social science research is concerned that kids are more isolated in front of computers. So what happens is they're just sitting there isolated in front of screens and they're not getting out playing with other kids. They're not learning how to collaborate and work together in teams. We're also starting to see with neuroscience research reading deficits with young children because the more time they're spending scrolling on the internet, think about this, it's scanning, it's skimming, it's scrolling, it's not reading, all right? I mean, they might be reading information, but it's not the same skill set as if you have a child reading a book. It requires much more attention and concentration skills that they're not getting the more screen time they have, the less time they're able or less able to read books because what's happening is it's much more of a line by line, page by page linear process. There's even new research concerned about childhood obesity and kids are just sedentary now. They're not getting out, moving around and playing because they're sedentary in front of screens. So what do we do about some of these big picture issues? And there is a lot of you know, concern, I think, of late. There we go. And one of the things that um, I was very honored, this picture is me at, <clears throat> excuse me, this picture is of myself, and I was the keynote speaker at the first International Congress on Internet Addiction Disorders held in Milan, Italy last year. And this was really a big honor but not only just to see myself in this role and where it's come, but when I started off, I said this has been a rapidly evolving field. I mean, there were delegates from a multitude of countries all talking about national and government initiatives that they were doing to deal with the prevention and treatment of internet addiction while America was seen as lagging behind. We have no government intervention. And this was really a big concern. I mean, just by comparison, Korea alone had over 500 inpatient 
units or hospitals treating internet addiction. Korea also had prevention programs in every single school system in their country. Again, we didn't really do that much. And I remember thinking a great deal about this when I you know, was flying back saying, what can we be doing? What are some of the things we can be doing right in our own community and schools? So I came up with this idea of being screen smart. And one of the issues really was that, you know, technology is a gift. And how we use it, we can use it rather wisely. So being screen smart is really kind of taking on the food role and saying, let's make smarter, wiser choices. So for example, could you be, you know, doing screenings in our schools to identify those kids that are most at risk? Could we be offering prevention classes to young children so they learn at an early age how to use the technology more responsibly? Could we be training teachers to look at, you know, assessing kids, look for warning signs and risk factors, and even intervening with them since they're on the front lines? Could we be talking directly to parents about some of these concerns? For example, I came up with the 3, 6, 9, 12 parenting guidelines. So at each developmental age, at age 3, at age 6, 9, and 12, parents really need different technology you know, rules, and I think kids have different technology needs. So I think collectively, if we start looking about this as being screen smart, I think overall, and looking at how we manage our technology in our day-to-day -day lives, we'll all have a more balanced way of using technology without being consumed by it. So thank you.